Collaborating with Steve was uh, like an experience I've never had before. I felt like he really encouraged myself and all the other actors to be quite heavily involved creatively from the beginning and almost wanted to shape the story and the characters around who we were as individuals. So like there were conversations that I was having with him from the off about, <clears throat> you know, my own personal history, my relationship with my mother, um, that he was sort of inspired by and then would incorporate that somehow into the story, which just meant that I had something that I could really connect to. Um, and throughout the whole experience, we've had a really kind of open dialogue and what he was trying to make. And um, he wanted me to be involved in that, which, which was which was really wonderful. So, um, yeah, I just, I, to, to work with a director who has such a respect for our craft in particular and will at all costs protect that and make us feel like we have a safe space to work in was amazing. Yeah, she was like a mom. She was really nice and kind and playful and stuff. We called each other names. Mm. She called me Smellia. I called her Shmush. Because he asked me to. Just so no. clear. No. Mm. Kind of. Kind of. And <laughs> yeah, she didn't seem like an adult. That's a compliment, by the way. That's, <laughs> that's a compliment. And yeah, she was just like a best friend. The connection that we found, it came about pretty organically. I think we were really lucky that we got on straight away. Um, I didn't want him to feel that he was working with someone that was like separate from him in any way. And I know the people that I worked with when I was young who I responded to the most and who I still think of so fondly now were the ones that didn't really look at somebody's age and I was just a, you know, I was a co-worker essentially and that's how it felt with myself and Elliot. I think it was really important that, because it's Elliot's movie and we were, we all had to be there to support that character, that this role that he had been given um, making you feel like you could do anything. So, um, yeah, I think because that was, that was my main focus, I think that helped also to solidify the mother-child relationship too. Because I always just had my eye on him. Favourite part was probably the flood. Um, I didn't. I never wanted to get out the water. My chaperone was like, "I need to get out the water," and I was like, "No, I don't want to get out the water. It's nice in here." Was it warm? Yeah, it was nice and warm. I had a wetsuit on, which yeah. made it more warm. But the wetsuit wasn't nice when you weren't in the water. No, you can't move in it. It's terrible. It's damp. And you, um, did you have to dive as well? Did you have to go like quite deep under the water? I did. When, because I get like yeah. blasted back and then I went I didn't launch myself backwards the water just went yeah I went quite deep and the stunt people were so they saved me in case they're the most fun do you not think yeah. the stunt people are stunt always people are really the most nice. fun yeah. the stunt people are really nice yeah. I was just under and then they'd be like yeah, you were, I remember coming in, I think the next day, and everyone was so impressed at how you handled that. Like, like an action hero. Yeah, and there were all the jets and stuff. Yeah. I was like... <laughs> it was surreal in those moments with Paul Weller where you had to sing. And especially when you had to sing and he was just playing the piano for you, <laughs> like that was just wild and kind of felt like this isn't how it should be. You're, <laughs> you're the rock star. Um, but he was so 
modest and you, I think you would forget pretty quickly that he was this like unbelievably iconic um, musician and you know he was so he was so pleased to be there but it was something that he had never done before he'd never I don't think he'd ever acted in anything so he really wanted to learn he really wanted to improve and I was able to be there for him and you were as well and then he was great with us when it came to you know us attempting to do what he does um, but yeah, it was a really lovely mix of, of people who had come from so many different backgrounds, like having musicians like Benjamin and Celeste and, and Paul, who um, who are also just really incredible performers, was um, just made it all more interesting, I think. Singing? I mean... I'd sung before, but I didn't really like singing. I mean, in front of people and mm -hmm. stuff. I mean, singing in Abbey Road with Paul Weller is something not a lot of people can say mm. they've done. And um, I mean, the singing part of it definitely wasn't my favorite part. It wasn't horrible, but... Um, I didn't like it as much. You were really good though. Um, I hope people just like, firstly they enjoy the movie. Um, and secondly, they, um, they kind of just figure out that we're all equal and when someone like in a situation of war like what well, I was it that's spoiler um hmm. in a situation of war we should all work together be strong and um we're all equal I guess we're all the same yeah we're no different from each other Historically wise, you know, we, we learned uh, a bit about the Blitz in school. A little bit, not much, if I'm really honest. You spent more time going over like Henry VIII and all that kind of stuff, do you know what I mean? Stuff that doesn't really have anything to do with you and Oliver Cromwell and all that kind of thing, which is, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I found history boring. That side of it, um, and the more interesting stuff, like Second World War and the First World War, we never really got to, do you know what I mean? Um, so my, basically, and this is kind of my knowledge of and how it came together, was I used to watch brilliant films with me nanny, uh, Sunday afternoon matinees and things like that, do you know what I mean? Um, where I kind of had an understanding of the Blitz, and my concept of that time period and everything was, was all those classic black and white films. Um, and that look of London and that kind of, cool, blimey, governor, what are we gonna do about this war then? That kind of image, do you know what I mean? And that that was my idea of, of the Blitz, really, basically. And then as you get a bit older, you kind of hear stories and, you know, you see more documentaries and things about how it affected people and what it was really like. But in the initial stages, it was more kind of brought up on them. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna be honest, and that's, you know, that's what attracted me to this film as well. That kind of classic, black and white films of that kind of era, do you know what I mean, that were on a Sunday afternoon that I used to watch with my nanny. And my aim was to try and incorporate some of those elements of those films that I'd watched within my performance, do you know what I mean? So it was kind of trying to marry them, them two things, the reality and the truth and, and the experience of what the characters were going to, which Steve does so beautifully, but then also kind of those historical films that I'd watched and trying to pepper the performance slightly with them. To really dive into that, how it affected people with Steve, we did a lot of research. 
Steve's meticulous at his research. Um, and he sent me a beautiful book to look at. And, you know, then with my voice coach as well, we looked into a lot of stuff and, and I started to watch a lot of documentaries and how it affected people at the time. So I tried to carry that kind of knowledge into the, into the performance and then try and base it. You know, to me, it was very kind of, it, it, there's a twisted paradox, I think, about a film, personally, from my perspective. It's um, it's kind of like a fairy tale of a boy trying to get back to his his mum, which in elements, you know, initially in the script, there was an element of Pinocchio about it. Um, and these wonderful characters he meets and he experiences along his way to get back home to his mum. And, you know, it's the harsh reality of these people that he's meeting. It's the adventure of a young boy trying to get home and these different characters that he meets on his way. His fairy godmother or his, his archangel who's trying to help him and guide him and help him get back home. And then he meets the likes of the wolf or, you know, different characters like that. And the, the young boys who he meets as well, who he kind of befriends. And his, it's his little rites of passage, that journey. He grows up quite a lot through that short space of time, do you know what I mean? Um, and our aim, was to, to play it as truthfully as possible and as realistic as possible with still kind of having that element of fantasy. I, I felt that's what I felt. It, it, it was really, that's where we were going with it. And I think that was Steve's aim as well, a lot at the time through it. There's a beautiful joy that he's extremely meticulous, like I've said, extremely meticulous. And he kind of knows the world and he fills you full of this history and this knowledge and we have deep conversations about character and then he just lets you play. It's really gorgeous, do you know what I mean? He just, he just allows you to find the freedom and find the truth within the scene. He has a wonderful way of making it very playful. Um, especially, you know, because we had young Elliot on set as well. So there was, we were mindful of trying to make him feel as real as possible, but also, you know, when you say cut, it's, it's, then it's Stephen being Stephen. But in that same respect, trying to grab hold of Elliot while he's in that moment and really push him, do you know what I mean? And play with him and push him to the edge in many ways, so he believes the reality of what's happening within the scene. And that's the kind of thing that Steve creates beautifully. He really sets a playground for you as an actor to, to find the truth in the scene and to find the truth in every moment. Um, yeah, and, he, and he, doesn't give you, he doesn't give you lots and lots and lots of notes at all. He doesn't, he allows you to find it and find it as a collective. And then he'll give you one little pointing They'll point you in one direction and you'll go with that and then it completely changes and transforms. Yeah, it was wonderful to work with. We filmed in a snooker hall um, and it was steeped in history because the snooker cues on the walls were not props, but they were actually real snooker cues that were in cases. And what Steve told me, the history of, of the place and what he'd found out from the people that, that, that managed it and ran it, was those snooker cues were the cues of men who'd gone to war. And so they left their snooker cues there for them for when they came back. Do you know what I mean? Um, so the beauty of that, the beauty, the tragedy, the kind of, you know, the duality of it, if you may, was that these snooker cues were in that hall and you could see all of these snooker cues and they were all men who never came back from the war, um, which made it tangible. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and I just think that that's the beauty of Steve. Details like that, which an audience would never be conscious of, but as an actor and, and as, a, as, a, as a collective crew, would aware of that, do you know what I mean? So it, yeah, yeah that, there was something special about that, I think. I hope that they find it enjoyable and entertaining, but at the same time, you know, there's, there's, it's, it's not trying to make a party political broadcast or anything like that, but it's just saying, look, this is the truth of and the harsh reality of what these people went through. Um, may we remind ourselves that we never wish to go through this again as a, 
not just as a society, but as a race, I think, personally, and that's very poignant for today. I had um, been a war artist in 2003. In the UK, we have a thing called the war artist, which is very strange. But um, I was in Basra and Baghdad, and um, at that moment, I just thought, what would have happened at home in London in 1940. And I was doing some research on another project, and I saw this picture of this boy, this young black child with a large overcoat, uh, a very large overcoat, big suitcase, and a cap waiting on a station. And um, kind of that was my end. I thought, he is my end, and I was seeing the war through a child's eyes. Because going back to being the war artist, I, you know, as a, as a you know, a, a civilian as such, you know, you, I, when do you ever get a chance to go to war? That's never a case of that, or want to go to war even. So therefore, being in that in that environment sort of just sort of um, really sort of stirred me to sort of want to sort of uh, do something about uh, uh, what it was like in 1940. Well, that was so important. The accuracy was so important. So I, I, we did a lot of research, a lot of research with the Imperial War Museum and with um, a historian called Joshua Le, uh, Levine. Uh, it was just really getting into the details of things and did, did a lot of research because I thought, I don't want to say anything or do anything which is sort of, you know, I'm not interested in, in sort of bending the, uh, sort of the truth or stuff. But at the same time, I want to make my movie. And what was beautiful about it, the things I found and I researched were just so amazing that it was like, okay, right. I could construct these narratives in a way to, to, to my story. So that was it. So it was, it was actually thrilling to sort of uh, have those sort of uh, things at my disposal to tell my story for sure. Well, Saoirse is, is obviously an amazing actress, an extraordinary amazing actress. And, um, you know, she, and the main thing about Saoirse was, could she sing? And that was, oh my God, because she sings it. And then, of course, she, able, she was able to sing like a bird because in the picture she plays a uh, Rita, who's a munitions worker, but also she's a sort of, uh, she's, she's a singer. And she was saying, like, amazing. Uh, so I was just extraordinarily happy. So she, and you can sing, bloody hell, what can't you do? And then we had um, Elliot, who, um, Elliot was interesting because he um, never had acted before in his life. And he, he auditioned, he was eight years old. I saw this kid, I thought, mm, this guy, could I have something? And that was it, we helped him, we worked with him. And yeah, he, he just flowered into this, this, this amazing sort of character, George. Um, and I think the chemistry happened also because, listen, Saoirse started acting when she was nine years old. Elliot, who plays George, was obviously nine years old when he played the character. So there was, I think, you know, Saoirse took him under, under her wing in a way, and it was a real kind of, a real affection. It was a real kind of bond and a real understanding. It was, it was very beautiful, it was, it was, it was palpable. And, uh, she was looking after him, and he was, you know, wonderful in the way of how he responded to her. So it was great. It's wonderful chemistry. Well, that was fun because you're talking about people doing things that they have never done before. So when you've got an actor who's never done something before, they're, they and it's, you know, they're up for it often because. It's, it's, the, it's the exploration, and when you sort of give them the details of, of the history of a character, or what they could have gone through, and you know, and what and what, what happened to him, like Stephen Graham, um, you know, it was it was incredible to talk to him about his character, for example, who you know, obviously a slightly damaged character. So again, it, it's it's one of those things where um, working with these great actors uh, is, is, is extremely encouraging to sort of find out that they still want to explore, even if it's a, if it's a small role. And again, you know. Harry Stickerson again with the fireman, and again a small role, but you tell them about the history of it, and they sort of send clicks in their brain. It's very rare you get to shoot a so-called epic in, in in London, in the UK, also in my hometown. So it was it was wonderful, sort of to be have this kind of camaraderie on, on behind camera and in front of camera. Uh, it was it was great. It was great. I think the, the, if there ever was a challenge, it was about the sort of the, the sort of epic quality and the sort of sort of more intimate quality. So the going from one to the other, sort of you know, ship, uh, shape shifting uh, as you as you went along, and to remind oneself that the intimate scenes are as important as the sort of large set pieces. 
So again, I, you know, it's like you know, jumping the hot bath and the cold bath, but, but at the same time having to sort of keep your composure. Wonderful. Um, yeah, uh, Jack and Duran and uh, Adam Stockhausen was fantastic. I mean, again, these are, these are the best of their field. I think what was exciting for me was how they responded in a very excited way about this period. Again, it's, it's something which has been done before, so obviously making films about this particular period, but they had a different take on it. And I suppose, in a way, this particular way of looking at the, this period had never been done before in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a larger scale like this, so they had lots to play with, and I think they were very excited. The song, which is called Winter's Coat, which um, Saoirse sings in the factory for the, uh, the, the musician's work, as she sees a factory, she works in a munitions factory, um, was inspired by my father, who, when he died, I was given his winter coat. And uh, I love the idea of the intimacy about it, the sort of sensualness about it, um, the tactile quality of, of, you know, putting something on and having this person sort of um, engulf you, sort of embrace you as, as a coat. So I thought that could be a very sort of um, beautiful sort of idea for a song. So myself and, and Nicholas Bretel, we, we sort of we started to write it um, in um, in Abbey Road, and, and Nicholas's uh, frequent collaborator, Torres Stinson, added uh, additional lyrics, which sort of you know, tied the, the the song in a bow, beautiful bow. Coming from a musical background, um, I had to realise that we're dealing with a historical event that happened in the 40s. And so it, was not, it wasn't a joke. It, you know, it, it was it's something that was an experience that was atrocious. People put their lives on the line for the safety of others. And so I had to be selfless and go in there and think about the very character who is a real character and forget about myself, think about what life could have been in the 40s. It was a huge challenge, but hopefully I managed to, um, to do a, a, a good enough job. I wasn't very much familiar with the uh, history of the Blitz because at school we learned uh, mostly about World War One, World War Two, uh, a bit of Dunkirk, and a bit of you know Ho Chi Minh and American history. Um, but I had the privilege of meeting Josh Levin, who gave me certain books to read about the Blitz. So I, I read a lot about it before um, I went on set at Hull and in London to perform. Um, it really helped me because it, it, it made me feel that I wasn't acting. I had to put myself in a place to reimagine and Steve worked with me as well to make sure that I understood what people went through during that time. Steve McQueen is, is a genius and he's an artist who knows what he wants. Um, some directors don't, other directors do, and he's like, incredible. I remember one occasion where he came up to me and whispered in my ears certain directions in a whole room full of, filled with at least 200 people. He whispered in my ears and told me that I should relax and that I should channel people like my father. Um, 
and that alone was sometimes enough for me to get to that place that he wanted me to get at. Elliot Heffman is a great human being, so he's a very beautiful child, um, and he pushed me a lot in a sense that he made it very natural um, uh, for me to work with him. I can only, you know, imagine what lies ahead of him. He's, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very hard worker and a natural. There's a scene in the movie where I had a monologue to address certain uh, prejudice um, in one of the shelters. And this is actually an actual event that happens in Eater Opinion's time, the character I, I um, embodied. This monologue, I feel, felt and I feel now, was very vital and is very vital to the times we live in right now. And so performing that scene was as if I was given the opportunity to, opportunity to say my last words before perhaps I die. And that moment will never be forgotten from my perspective at least. It was great, it was raining. <laughs> as usual, <laughs> um, but, and, and cold. But overall, I felt proud. I felt proud that, you know, about how people stood, you know, at the face of, of peril, and how resilient people were in the at the face of calamity. That, that that just the, the the being in certain t scenes made me reflect and ponder and become eventually proud. I'm not a nationalist, <laughs> but certain places like when we were in shelter shelter um, made me really think about what people before me did so that I can be here. I hope people, global people, um, around the world, um, take time to reflect. Um, after watching this movie, I want them to get inspired to help each other, to care for their children, uh, to be hopeful, but also to act, to act upon your hope, to act upon your love, to act upon obvious resilience as humans um, at the face of uh, uh, disasters. I want them to believe that they can um, achieve every possibility to bring peace.